It's my pleasure to be talking to you, Victoria, today. Could you please introduce yourself and what you do for business? So I'm either Victoria or Vicky uh, Brewster, as most people know me. Uh, my business is a bit eclectic. I'm a trained social worker, case manager. I do furniture refinishing, grief, loss work, uh, life wellness coaching. <laughs> I believe multiple streams of income are important because you never know. Yeah, certainly. That's very interesting. So uh, let's start with the difficult part. Describe the accidents you have been through. Okay. Uh, I've been through a lot of them, actually. <laughs> So uh, recently I had to do a whole history. So I found out at the age of two and a half, I uh, tripped up cement stairs and hit my head. Uh, probably a few months after I almost drowned in a pool because my brother pulled down the stairs to an above ground pool. And of course, being the inquisitive <laughs> toddler I was, I went in the pool. Uh, my mom fetched me out. So it turns out I almost drowned. Um, Fast forward to probably age 14, I, I slipped on a cement uh, garage floor, I hit the back of my head. <laughs> when I was about 16, I was in a car accident with my mom. We walked away from it, but probably whiplash, but they didn't know that was back then. Um, car accident again, graduate school, coming home from school. <laughs> Three miles, literally from my parents' house, I hit black ice, totally totaled my car. Somehow I walked away from that <laughs> accident. Again, considering the time frame, you're looking at 1996, so still whiplash was a bit uh, not so known about. Um, and then uh, in October of 2018, I tripped up the stairs of my house. So most people don't realize that concussions can happen anywhere. And when they say that accidents happen close to home, they're not kidding. <laughs> So I did, I, I, luckily I turned, I hit my shoulder, the whole uh, left side of my face hit, I blacked out, I don't know how long. Uh, two months after that, I couldn't travel back to the States because I was on sick leave and you're not allowed to. So imagine six adults, two, two dogs, a cat, in a tiny upper duplex. <laughs> I tripped over a laundry basket, putting the top of my head into a wall. So uh, that concussion of course continued and it was five months off work. I went back to work in March of 2019, and then in August, minding my own business, riding along the bike path of Montreal, this guy comes out of nowhere, not quite sure why, there's nobody in front of us, nobody behind us, he hits me, I go flying, I land in the street, very concerned, make sure I don't hit my head, no cars, thank God, because had there been cars, I would have been hit. Um, I had to bike 15 kilometers back home. <laughs> with the whole right side of my body pretty much being um, non-functioning, <laughs> the top part. And that was a couple months recovery. Um, and then the pandemic hit here. So most people don't realize in Montreal, the pandemic hit here in, in mid-March. Um, none of us really were prepared at all. Uh, I work as a case manager with seniors and for my colleagues who have young kids or, or husbands or spouses that work in the government or whatever, they have to be the ones that stay home with the kids. So the rest of us were filling in as we needed to. So I, besides working my normal job, I was grocery shopping, delivering food cards, senior clients, whatever. I ended up getting sick and I was laid up at home for uh, six weeks. I was told to quarantine myself in my home for six weeks, could not leave my house. <laughs> It was hard. I had to send my kids to their dad. I didn't see my kids for a month. Uh, my only contact with people outside was text messaging and um, WhatsApp or texting because I couldn't talk. I was coughing so much that every time I tried to talk, I ended up coughing. My partner at the time, um, we're not together anymore, um, because he has asthma and allergies, I had to quarantine myself literally in my living room for five weeks. <laughs> So it's, uh, it's been a long journey, but uh, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm okay. still, uh, still positive. <laughs> so um, what have you learned through this uh, interesting journey? You never know what's going to happen. I, I think uh, if anything I've learned, you have to be flexible. You have to be positive. You have to be optimistic. You can't let anything stop you. You, you have to still maintain your... Um, Optimism, I think that's super important. Your connection to whoever. I mean, I was very lucky during my quarantine. I had a lot of people 
I've been on LinkedIn and Facebook for quite a few years and I had colleagues from Africa and India and everybody giving me advice because I was not setting foot outside my house. I wasn't going to a hospital or a clinic because I knew if I did, I probably wouldn't come back home. That's how bad it was here at the time. So I, I've learned to rely on myself, but also that I need to ask for help, which is not easy for me. So I had to turn to people who agreed with my mindset of homeopathic and herbs and could offer me any advice. So flexibility is super important. Perfect. Uh, let's go to your ideas and the mentality. What is a pay uh, it forward mentality? So pay, pay it forward is um, it's a mentality, meaning if somebody helps me, I help somebody else or I help that person in return. So. I'm part of different groups on uh, LinkedIn and uh, Facebook and social media. One of them is Global Goodwill Ambassadors, which is around the world. There's people from every country. It's humanitarian, mine is humanitarian. It could be education, it could be other things. It's really giving back to your community, which I think is super important. And pay it forward is, again, if, if you do something for me, I'm gonna do something for you in exchange. So it's almost like a bartering kind of thing. It's not based on money per se. Um, and I think considering the pandemic we're in, I think it makes sense. Certainly. Uh, why does giving back to the community uh, matter? Why is it important nowadays? So I've lived here in Montreal for 21 years. I know my community. I've worked here for 20 years of it. I work with seniors. I have a lot of connections in the community. Um, I hear what's needed. I, I see what's needed. I sense it. And it's, you know, it's just kind of a vibe you pick up on. I, I think it's super important to give back to the area you live in, uh, volunteering financially, whatever you can do. So I, I think as a human, I think it's our responsibility to give back to where we live. <laughs> Why do you think that? I was raised that way. My uh, my dad has always been involved in volunteer work. He's in Rotary. He's in Lodge. He's in different uh, groups in the community. Um, I was raised Catholic, but I converted to Judaism 21 years ago when I married my ex. And I I just think it's just part of a mindset. I think I think it's important to give back, whether through religion, where you live. To me, it's just part of being human. How does it make you feel to uh, help, especially for free? It's the best feeling in the world for me. <laughs> I, so I went into social work for a reason. I didn't go into it for the money. Um, I went into it because it, it was the right fit for me and I knew that. So that's why. <laughs> Perfect. What volunteering activities have you taken part in? So I do a lot. Um, I've been involved with my kids' schools since they were young. So my uh, youngest is going on 14. My oldest is going on 18. I volunteered in their schools. I, I participated in the library, pizza lunch, reading in class, extracurricular activities, trips. I think the best way for a parent to really know what's going on in the school environment is to volunteer. It's the only way you get in. <laughs> Um, otherwise, you show up for parent-teacher conferences or you show up for uh, various events, but unless you're volunteering and you're involved, you never truly know what's going on in the school. <laughs> and when it comes to my community, again, it, to me, it's just a, it's just a given. Okay. What, what an end-of-life um, specialist did on? So I did a, a certification a couple of years ago with somebody for end of life. So end of life is when somebody knows basically that they're going to die. It could be two months, a month, three months. They could know within six months. Um, people sometimes want to talk about things that their families just can't or, or are unwilling to. I find quite a bit since I work with seniors, adult children have a really hard time for the most part. <laughs> having these conversations with their parents because they still think of their parent in the way that they thought of them when they were a teenager or a kid. I think even as an adult child, it's hard sometimes for kids to change their mindset, change their mentality. So I find uh, a lot of my clients want to talk about things that their kids can't talk about with them. So if they bring it up with me, I'm always, always open and they know this. They can talk about anything with me. 
uh, if it's uncomfortable for me, I'll tell them because I'm very honest. For the most part, I'm a pretty open professional so that they know they can bring up pretty much anything with me and I'll talk about it. So end of life, you know, it's an area a lot of people don't want to go into. I think death makes a lot of people uncomfortable, but the thing about this pandemic, as bad as it is, I think it's brought up a lot of issues and a lot of things that people really have no choice but to deal with now because it's literally thrown in our faces. What so. have you learned about people uh, through this, uh, these moments? Most people just want somebody to listen. They want somebody to care. They want somebody just to, just to be there. So I've made myself available on social media. A lot of people know they can text me, message me. They can Facebook, LinkedIn, if they happen to know my WhatsApp or Viber, whatever, they can message me if I'm available. I will be there for them. If I can't be, I'll tell them. If they tell me it's crisis, I'm going to refer them to the appropriate source. Um, people really were there for me when I was sick during April and May, and uh, this to me is my way of paying it forward. Um, unfortunately, because of my concussion, when I was off work for five weeks, same thing. I had amazing professionals and friends, colleagues around the world who were there for me. So this is my way of paying society back, I guess. Perfect. What are the requirements to be an end-of-life specialist? I happen to be a trained social worker. I have a master's in social work. I've worked in the field for 23 years. I'd like to think my experiences were something. <laughs> um, I started out as a therapist with youth and families. After a year and a half, I realized eventually I was going to have my own kids and I'm like, I can't do this. Um, it was very, very hard. I found working, especially with really young children who had been through things most of us can't even imagine. I switched to adults. Um, love 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 working with seniors i've worked with them for 20 years and when you talk to a senior and you think of everything they've been through i'm always amazed because i like when i think of my time frame like besides like i don't know the iraqi war or 9-11 uh, the pandemic like there isn't really a lot to talk about seniors have so much to talk about <laughs> seniors have lived through the great depression world war ii civil rights uh women's vote, um, <laughs> keep going through all the various wars over the years, 9-11, um, the pandemic, electricity, like, what can I talk about? The fact that my computer became a phone, you know, it's, it's, I can't compare. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that exactly answers your question, but. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. So let, let's move to another aspect about you. You write books. Yes. Uh, what is your second book about? So I have a co-author. So uh, Julie uh, sager Dierberg and I met back in 2013, 2014. Uh, we both unfortunately have dealt with a lot of death in our lives and we both felt this was an area we wanted to delve into. So we decided, hey, let's write a book together. <laughs> so in 2017, we published a book on death and dying and uh, grief and loss. Uh, besides us, there's 52 other professionals in the book talking about pretty much every aspect of death from pets, spouses, children, grandparents, uh, partners, professional relationships, uh, doctors, nurses, lawyers. I even put in stuff about end of life and um, euthanasia. What, there's different terms for end of life around the world. And then we were told our book was too much and too big. <laughs> so we're republishing it this fall. We've divided the book into two to make it more of a professional book on one end, on the other end is stories uh, about different relationships and what people have gone through. So book two is taking that further and really focusing on uh, ethnicity and religion and culture and how they each view death, dying, grief, and loss because each one has a different acceptance, willingness <laughs> to plan for, talk about death, dying, end of life, <laughs> grief, and loss. Every culture is different. Colors, I mean, I love purple. Purple to me is an amazing color, but I recently learned in Brazil, purple represents death, or to me it's spiritual and it represents a whole different thing. <laughs> it's royalty. Uh, there's like so much that goes along with it. Black, do you know how many weddings I've been to that people wear black? Now black for me represents typically death, 
uh, grieving to go to a wedding, especially here in Montreal, where I'm the only one wearing a colorful dress besides like one other person and everybody else is wearing black. I'm like, did I miss something? <laughs> because black, again, color has different meanings for different cultures, ethnicities, whatever. So black can be um, sophistication, uh, celebration, but in some cultures, like I have a friend who's Italian, when her grandmother died, she wore black for a month in order to honor her grandmother's death. So it has a different meaning. Yeah, certainly. That's so interesting because people interpret these things in their own way. Yes. Yeah. Great. Let's move to the next question. What cultural differences are you aware of regarding death around the world? Oh, a lot. <laughs> The more I read up, I find Amish, and uh, if you go to uh, Africa, and you go to Singapore, and you go to Brazil, and you go to uh, Catholic, and you go to Judaism, there's so much different uh, meaning, representation, the way that they do death. I can say as somebody who converted to Judaism 21 years ago, the thing about a shiva, so when somebody dies, a shiva is, if you've lost a spouse, a parent, a child, uh, a grandchild, you have a you have kind of this period of mourning where the community supports you. So it can be anywhere from three to seven days. It's up to you the hours of it. People either come to your home, you do it out at a synagogue or a hotel. I can tell you the best thing about it is the reason for it is those first that first week, you're lost. Like you're, you're like barely you're like you're you're in shock still. You're barely functioning. So people coming over and bringing you food so you don't have to worry about it, people coming over to distract you, and bring up memories and pictures and funny stories and whatever it is. The reason behind it is to support the person that's going through the initial uh, shock and grief. Uh, and then after that in Judaism, there's a 30 day mourning period that'll, depending on how religious you are, you'll follow it, no music, people wear black, they either pray at home, they go to synagogue, they're again supported by the community so that they're not alone. So other cultures have similar things depending on where they're from. Um, personally, I find it fascinating the more I read that to find out different cultures have different traditions and, and I don't know, maybe it's just me, but <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, and what is your solo book about? So my, my solo book I published, um, I started it before my concussion in uh, October 2018. It's my memoir. It's really my life history, my life story. I've had a lot happen to me in my life. Uh, but the thing is, because my kids are underage, I use no names. It's all in the third person. But people get enough from it that it's helpful. And if anything I've been through can help somebody else, then the book has served a purpose. But it's been almost two years and I can tell you a lot has happened in the past two years, unfortunately, I guess. Uh, so I'm planning to republish uh, because I, um, recovery from the concussion, the bike accident, <laughs> the pandemic, there's a lot there. Um, look, I, I've, I moved to a new country. I changed religions. I suffered miscarriages between my kids. I'm divorced. I'm shared custody of my teens. I was with somebody else. I unfortunately had to end that relationship at the same time that we had the pandemic and I was sick. Um, but it was necessary and needed because I realized this just, it was not gonna, I couldn't imagine being with this person five, 10, 15 years from now. So I think it's better to make that decision now than later. Uh, I think unfortunately a lot of people choose to remain in relationships because of society, culture, religion, family, and uh, it really should be about themselves and what they think is the best thing for themselves. And you know what? Sometimes you just have to say, forget everybody else. <laughs> and you need, to f you need to focus on yourself. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a fact, sure. So let, let's go to another area. And that's your specialty. How can you make people comfortable with the uncomfortable? So when I use that term, it's really about death and dying, grief and loss, because I find a lot of people are not feeling it's okay to talk about it or voice an opinion about it. 
I always make sure my clients, my friends, colleagues, whoever, know they can talk to me about anything. If I'm not comfortable, I'm going to tell them. <laughs> or I'm going to say, that's not my area. I think you should talk to somebody else or I'll refer them. Uh, I have clients, again, that can't talk about things with their own kids, their own families. I'm, I'm a pretty intuitive person and I'm an empath. So I pick up a lot on nonverbal Nonverbal is super important, which means body language, tone of voice, facial expressions. Um, and I use myself a lot. My clients know things about me without knowing all the details. I mean, I've known some of my, I've worked where I've worked for 20 years. So my clients have seen me pregnant. They've seen me go through marriage, divorce, uh, teenagers. They've met my kids. Um, which I don't think is a bad thing. And some of my clients I've been with for that whole 20 years, which is extremely unusual. And of course you get to know one another, right? So I find I use myself a lot because by talking about myself, it makes people comfortable. I may not go into minute details, but I'll give, you know, an overview. And then people know it's okay that they can talk to me. So I think making people with the comfortable is letting them know it's okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> it's really okay. So the next question is, why is self-worth internal? You know what? You have to like yourself. You have to love yourself. You have to work on yourself in order to help people. If you don't, you're just not, a, you're not fully available. So you have to have self-worth in order to give others the permission to have self-worth. <laughs> Okay, let me rephrase like a number of your questions. You said you need, you need to care about yourself. Uh, you need to have self-worth. You need to, uh, like when we spoke about the, the school and the children, you said that you need to get engaged to understand what's really happening. Like you are asking people and you're asking parents, especially for more than they can do. Like the yeah. usual... They usually send the kids to school, they do the homework, and that's it. enough. Yeah, that was never enough for me. Um, when my kids would come home and they'd mention things to me, I'd be like, okay, so I'm a social worker. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check into it, right? So the best way is by volunteering because your kids don't really want you to talk to their teachers. <laughs> they don't want you to talk to the principal. So if there's a trip volunteer to be a parent on that trip, volunteer to be a chaperone, because it's the best way to know exactly what's going on. You get to meet their friends in a school setting. Uh, you get to see the teachers. You get to see the dynamics you would never see any other way. So once I started doing that, my kids would always come to me and be like, can you volunteer? Can you come? And like, as much as I could, I would, but I was also still working. So if I couldn't go on one trip, I at least went on another one. And volunteering in the kids' classroom. So when my, when my youngest, who's now almost 14, was in like second grade, I would, like I was working part-time, I would go in, I would read to kids. So kids who were, who were struggling, because uh, here in Quebec, uh, I'm an immigrant, so if it, was up to, if it was based on me, my kids would be going to French school. Because their dad is, went to English school, they go to an English school system, but their program is bilingual. So kindergarten, first, second grade, pure French. Now, my French is not very good. So the hour, hour and a half the teacher would teach English, she can only focus on so many kids. She's in a class with 25 kids. So if I come in and perhaps I help those kids whose parents are immigrants and really don't know English, and I spend an hour with them and I'm helping them learn to read, I'm developing a relationship. My kid sees me in the class, so they know I care. I'm devoting what, one hour a week? Like, it's like giving up a lunch hour. So to me, to me, it was important. Now, I know not everybody can do this, but if you can go on a trip once a year and chaperone for whatever trip it is your kids are on, you know what? Your kids are going to remember that. And it's the best way to see your kids in a school environment where you're kind of watching them but not being obvious about it, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, let's move to another area. Do words have power? Yes. So as a writer and author, I'm very careful of the words I use. Even on social media, I'm extremely cautious. Uh, if somebody sends me a comment 
I don't reply right away if it's something that right away I react to, but in a negative way, I have to think about it because I know once I put that answer out there, somebody can take a picture of it. They can, they can save it in such a way. You have to be really, really careful. I find on social media, um, as a social worker, I also have to be careful because I live in my community. I work in my community. Yes, I have outside interests, but my outside interests still kind of can affect my professional work interests outside of my self-employment uh, with my employer. So I'm still very careful of what I say because if it comes back, they're going to talk to me about it. <laughs> So I think people have to be really careful, both in spoken words and written words. Spoken, unless the person's recording it, you can deny it later on, but I don't ever want to be accused of something. When it's put in writing, it's so much harder to take back. So I think if somebody sends something to you that's negative or is, provokes such a reaction from you that your response immediately is not positive, don't answer it. Like, really think about it before you reply. That's so strong and so it's like interesting because usually the response is impulsive without deep thinking. Yeah, so I, I really caution people, don't, don't react. If you want to react, put it in writing on a piece of paper, get your thoughts out, but don't put it on social media. Think about it, you know, see how you feel in an hour, two hours, even half a day later, even a day later before you respond. Uh, I just think it's better to be cautious. <laughs> Okay, the next question is, what is simple refinishing? So because I'm on sick leave from work and I'm only making half of what I normally make on my salary, <laughs> I still have to prov provide for my kids, my basic bills, whatever. So I had to come up with a, an al alternate kind of backup source. So I'm lucky in that my dad taught me about furniture refinishing. He's a woodworker. So I've, I've learned how to refinish wood. So I can strip it, I can sand it, I can refinish it, paint it, stain it, refinish it, whatever. I can do the same thing with metal products. Uh, I took up painting again recently, which is for a couple different reasons. So I paint on glass. So whether it's like wine glasses or a vase, uh, I took a wrought iron metal table and I refinished the bottom part. I had a glass top. I painted this. I, I don't know. I just went with whatever was in my head at the time. I paint this really awesome design on top. I'm trying to sell that, obviously. I think people, when it comes to, you can't just rely on one stream of income. <laughs> you know, I'm part of a mastermind group that I was invited to about a month ago. And one of the key things from that is you cannot have one source of income. You need to know that if one fails, you have two, three, four, five others to rely on. So for me, it's turning to what I know. Uh, either I know from experience I've worked in, it's an interest of mine. So besides being a case manager, social worker, and an author, <laughs> I'm doing the furniture refinishing. Grief and loss is an area of mine, but I'm kind of limited because of the pandemic. A lot of the work I need to do is face-to-face -face and in groups or one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, it can be done like this in a Zoom kind of thing, but it's, it's not the same thing. Uh, there's so much that's face-to-face -face as an in-person that you kind of need. Um, so simple refinishing to me is that. It's refinishing of, refurbishing of furniture items that other people kind of throw to the side. And I'm like, oh, this is so cool. Give it to me <laughs> and I'm going to fix it <laughs> and resell it <laughs> because, I mean, I love antiques. I love, I love stuff that's vintage. I just, there's so much stuff that things were so well made. <laughs> I think when my parents grew up and when you look at today's world, the TV of today is so not the TV that I grew up with. I mean, yes, it's got better features and whatever, but it's probably going to die within two to three years where the, the TV I grew up with lasted for like 10, 15, 20 years. So. What else would you like? Would I like? Yeah. Would you like to say? Um, I think people have to be flexible. I think people have to keep an open mind. I think people have to be willing to think outside of their comfort zone. Um, if anything, I find this pandemic has taught me, especially because I was sick, because I was in quarantine, I had to ask for help, which is really hard for me because it's usually the opposite. <laughs> so 
I had to ask like friends from the outside to go shopping for me and buy me special food because I was put on this like organic, natural, like super special diet to kind of remove toxins from my system, which is amazing, by the way, once you do it, <laughs> changes your life in a lot of ways. Um, it's not easy, but I learned a lot from it. I learned to rely on myself. I learned I had to be comfortable with myself. Um, and that it was okay to ask others for assistance when it's been the opposite for me. It's usually people coming to me. So flexibility I find is huge. Okay, as a person, as a human, do you think you have delivered your message to the world? Partly. I think I still have a lot to do. I think when I think of everything I've been through in my life with all my accidents and things that have gone on, I think there's still a lot left for me. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm up for the challenge. <laughs> I, uh, I see the world very differently coming out of being in quarantine for six weeks <laughs> and really not being able to leave my house, not being able to talk to anybody, not being able to see my kids. Uh, besides having to really look inside myself and kind of reevaluate and self-reflection, when I came out of that six weeks, when I came out kind of into the world again, in a sense, it was very different. And I don't know if it was different because it was pandemic or if it was different because of what, what I went through. <laughs> um, but I, I still feel like I have so much left to do. And if I've made it this far, considering everything I've been through, uh, like I said, I'm up for the challenge. <laughs> Yeah, you're up for the challenge. We wish you like a fantastic life ahead. I really Thank appreciate you. your time and the uh, nice smile. Thank you. <laughs> Enjoy your evening and thank you so much indeed for your time. Thank you.